Hello everybody and welcome to episode 8 of the Wild Robots. Last we heard from Miss Lindsay, we encountered Pinktail the Possum and it juggled my memory of a funny memory back at school. So one day on the back turf, we were all going out there, I can't remember if it was for recess or what, but some people in the back, back corner found a dead possum and everybody was flipping out and we were like, oh, that's gross and we gotta get rid of it. So we had some people come and get rid of it. And then sure enough, the possum was just pretending to be dead. Everybody thought he was dead, but when they went to go check on it and move it, the possum was just pretending and it got up and scurried along. And so it couldn't help but think of that funny memory of when we were tricked by a possum as well. So just like Roz was tricked, we were tricked too. So I thought that was funny. But we did leave off with Miss Lindsay um, hearing about the hatchling that hatched, the gosling that hatched. So let's see what happens because that little gosling was really hungry and I wonder what's gonna happen. All right, chapter 28, the old goose. Ordinarily, the forest animals would have run away from the monster, but they were awfully curious why she was carrying a hatchling on her shoulder. And once Roz explained the situation, the animals actually tried to help. A frog pointed Ross up to the squirrels. A squirrel recommended that she speak with, mag with the magpies and then a magpie sent them over to the beaver pond. The ground grew soggier and grass grew taller, and soon the robot and the gosling were looking across a wide murky pond. Dragonflies buzzed through the reeds, turtles sunned themselves on a log, schools of small fish gathered in the shadows, and there, floating in the center of the pond, was an old gray goose. A very good morning to you, the robot's friendly voice boomed over the water. I have an adorable little gosling with me. The goose just stared. Here's a picture of the goose. The goose just stared. I am in great need of your assistance, said Roz. Actually, the gosling is in need of your assistance. The goose didn't move. Food, peeped the gosling. Food, food. That tiny voice was more the, than the old goose, goose could bear, and she began gliding across the pond and squawked to the robot. What are you doing with that hungry hatchling? Where are his parents? There was a terrible accident, said Roz. It was my fault. This gosling is the only survivor. If there was a terrible accident, why does your voice sound so cheerful? The goose flapped her wings. Are you sure you didn't eat his parents? I am sure I did not eat his parents, said Roz, turning, returning to her normal voice. I do not eat anything, including parents. The goose squinted at the robot. Then she said, do you know who his parents were? I do not know. Well, they must have belonged to one of the other flocks on the island because nobody in my flock is missing. Will you take the gosling? I most certainly will not, squeaked the goose. I can't take an every orphan I see. You say this is your fault? It seems to me that it's up to you to make things right. Mama, Mama, peeped the gosling. I've tried to tell him that I'm not his mother, said the robot, but he does not understand. Well, you'll have to act like his mother if you want him to survive. There was, a, there was that word again, act. Very slowly, the robot was learning to act friendly. Maybe she could learn to act motherly as well. You do want him to survive, don't you, said the goose. Yes, I do want him to survive, said the robot, but I do not know how to act like a mother. Oh, it's nothing. You just have to provide the gosling with food and water and shelter. Make him feel loved, but don't pamper him too much. Keep him away from danger and make sure he learns to walk and talk and swim and fly and get along with the others and look after himself. And that's really all there is to motherhood. The robot just stared. Mama, food, said the gosling. Now would probably be a good time to feed your son, said the goose. Yes, of course, said the robot. What should I feed him? Give him some smashed up grass. And if, that, and if a few insects get in there, all the better. 
Roz tore several blades of grass from the ground. She mashed them into a ball and then dropped the ball into the nest. The gosling shook its tail feathers and chewed his very first bites of food. By the way, my name is Loudwing, said the goose. Everyone already knows your name, Roz, but what's the gosling's name? I do not know, the robot looked at her adopted son. What is your name, gosling? He can't name himself, squawked Loudwing. And then, with a loud burst of wing beats, the goose fluttered up from the pond and landed right on Roz's head. Water streamed down the robot's dusty body as Loudwing leaned over the nest. Oh dear, he certainly is a tiny thing, said Loudwing. He must be a runt. I'll warn you, Roz. Runts usually don't last very long. And with you for a mother, it'll take a miracle for him to survive. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. However, the gosling still deserves a name. Let's see here. His bill is unusually bright color. It's actually quite lovely. If I were his mother, I'd call him Brightbill. But you're his mother, so it's up to you. His name will be Brightbill, said Roz, as the goose fluttered back to the water. And we will live by this pond where he can be around other geese. I'll find us a sturdy tree nearby. You will do no such thing, the goose flapped her wings. A tree is no place for a gosling. Brightbill needs to live on the ground like normal goose, like a normal goose. Loudwing seized up the robot. L Loudwing sized up the robot. I suppose you two will need a rather large home. You'd better speak to Mr. Beaver. He can build anything. He's a little gruff at times, but if you're extra friendly, I'm sure he'll help you out. And if he gives you trouble, remind him that he owes me a favor. Chapter 29, The Beavers. Every day the beavers swam along their dam, inspecting and repairing it. The wall of wood and mud allowed only a trickle of water to pass through, and it had turned a narrow stream into a wide pond that many animals now call home. As Roz and Brightbill walked around the pond, they passed hundreds of chewed up tree, tr tree stumps, proof that the beavers needed a constant supply of wood, and this gave Roz an idea. The robot swung her flattened hand, and the sound of chopping wood echoed across the water. They were soon replaced by the sounds of footsteps and shaking leaves as the robot carefully walked along the beaver dam with a gosling on her shoulder and a freshly cut tree in her hands. The beavers floated beside their lodge and stared at the bizarre sight with open mouths until Mr. Beaver slapped his broad tail on the water, which meant stop right there. The robot stopped. Hello, beavers. My name is Roz, and this is Brightbell. Please do not be frightened. I am not dangerous, she held out the tree. I have brought you a gift. I thought perhaps you could use this in your beautiful dam. No thanks, said Mr. Beaver. I have a strict policy never to accept gifts from the mon from monsters. Don't be ridiculous, interrupted Mrs. Beaver. We can't let a perfectly good birch go to waste. I'm afraid I must insist, said Mr. Beaver. Mrs. Beaver turned to her husband. Remember how you asked me to point out when you're being stubborn and rude? Well, you're being stubborn and rude. Then she turned back to Roz. Thank you, monster. If you'd be so kind to drop the tree in the water, we'll take it from there. I am not a monster, Roz tossed the tree like a twig. I'm a robot. The tree smacked against the water and sent the beavers bobbing up and down. Just then, Brightbill started peeping. Mama, hungry. So Roz dropped the ball of grass into the nest. The gosling thinks you're his mother, came a quiet voice. It was Paddler, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver's son. His real mother is dead, said Roz, so I have adopted him. There was a brief silence. Then Paddler looked up at Roz and said, you're a very good robot to take care of Brightbill. Mr. Beaver sighed. Yes, yes, that's very good of you, Roz, but I don't understand what any of this has to do with us. My son and I need a home, and Loudwood said, and Loudwing said you would help us build one. Of course she did, Mr. Beaver muttered to himself. Loudwing gets me out of one lousy jam, and I spend the rest of my days doing her favors. 
Mrs. Beaver glared at her husband. Sorry, he said, realizing he was being stubborn and rude again. Stay right there, Roz. We need to find, we need to have a family meeting. The three beavers slipped under the water and a moment later, their muffled voices could be heard inside the lodge. The robot stood on the dam and patiently waited with, their, with her son. Mama, Mama! Yes, Bright Bill, I'm trying to act like a good mother. A ripple and Mr. Beaver's head appeared above the water. If you bring us four more trees, good and healthy ones, maybe I'll have time to help you with the gosling. That is wonderful, said the robot. We will be back. Chapter 30, The Nest. I've built my fair share of lodges over the years, Mr. Beaver stood at the water's edge, but I can't say I've ever built one for a robot and a gosling, so just what exactly do you need? We need a lodge big enough for us both, said Ross. It should be comfortable and safe, and it should be near the pond. How long do you plan on living in this lodge? I do not know. Then we'd better make sure it's strong and sturdy, Mr. Beaver stroked his whiskers as he thought. Do you plan on having friends over? The missus loves to entertain guests. I do not have any friends. No friends? Well, you seem pretty likable for a monster. I mean, a robot. But if you want my advice, you should grow yourself a garden. Your neighbors won't be able to resist fresh herbs and berries and flowers. Just you wait and see. So, we'll make sure there's a place for a garden and we'll give your give your lodge some extra space for all the friends you'll be hosting. The beaver winked. We also need to find a way to keep your lodge comfortable when it's cold outside. Our lodge is heated by our own bodies, but I think we'll have to find another way to heat yours. The beaver and the robot thought about heat for a while. The first thing that came to Roz's mind was the sun. But then she remembered the hot sparks she had felt when sliding down the mountain peak. I could heat our lodge with fire, she said. Mr. Beaver blinked a little. He blinked his little eyes. I will need to experiment, Roz continued, but I think there is a way. You go right ahead, Roz, said the beaver, but would you try and not burn down the entire forest? Do not worry, I will be careful. Let's move on, Mr. Beaver sighed. The next order of business is to find a site for your lodge. That metal across the water would be perfect but the hares will have to, will have a fit if we try to build there. I think we should clear out some trees and build right in the forest, and I know just the place. The beaver took them along the water and up to a dense section of forest that jutted into the pond. It needs some work, said Mr. Beaver, trudging through the thick weeds, but this ought to do the job. Yes, this ought to do the job, said Roz in her friendliest voice. Job, said Bright Bill. Mr. Mr. Beaver was incredibly skilled at taking down trees, even he could, but even he couldn't keep up with Roz's powerful chopping hands. So he let the robot do the hard work. He pointed out the trees and shrubs that needed to go, and Roz started hacking away. By sunset, they were standing in a newly cleared site, and they had more than enough wood to build the lodge. You did some fine work today, Roz, Mr. Beaver yawned. I'll return in the morning, and we'll pick up right where we left off. What would you like for me to do? Said the robot, tonight? So you still feel like working, do you? Very good. Well, you can start by digging out these tree stumps and you can collect all those large flat stones over there and you can smooth down the patches of dirt so we have a level place to build. That should keep you busy. The next morning, Mr. Beaver returned to find that Roz had been very busy indeed. All the tree stumps had been dug up and their holes filled in with dirt. 20 large stones had been stacked and the ground was now perfectly level. But what most astonished Mr. Beaver was Roz and Bright Bill were huddled around a small cracking fire, crackling fire, campfire. Mr. Beaver moved his lips, but no words came out. Bright Bill was, so, was cold last night, said Roz, so I taught myself how to make a fire. But, but, but how? I discovered that when I strike these two stones together, they create sparks like this. I directed sparks into dry leaves and wood until they ignited. Once I had a fire, it was easy to keep it going. And if I need to put it out, I can just add water. 
Mr. Beaver sat and warmed his paws. I've never seen fire in such a neat little bundle. He stared into the flames. I've only seen it blazing through the forest, burning everything in its path, but this is marvelous. He took another minute to enjoy the warmth. Then he and the robot got back to work. Mr. Beaver asked Roz to dig a trench here, to place large stones there, to arrange logs this way, to smear mud that way. Birds and squirrels perched in the trees and watched the new lodge take shape. It resembled a beaver lodge, but it was larger a great dome of wood and mud and leaves. A simple opening in the wall served, served as the entrance, and the door was nothing more than a heavy stone that the robot could slide out of the way. Here's a picture. Oops. Inside the lodge was one big round room. The arch ceiling was high enough that Roz could stand upright. A fire pit was set into the center of the floor and a mesh of thin branches above acted as a vent. Long stones lined the interior walls like benches and were covered with thick cushions of moss. There was even a hole for storing food and water for Bright Bell. You've got yourself a beautiful pond view property, said Mr. Beaver. What are you going to name it? I do not understand. Why, a beautiful lodge like this deserves a name. We call our lodge Stream Catcher. The robot's computer brain didn't take long. The lodge is for Bright Bell. Bright Bell is a bird. Birds live in nests. Should we call this lodge the nest? Huzzah, squeaked the, the beaver. The nest is a fine name for your lodge. Nest, nest, laughed Bright Bell. They stood outside the nest and admired their handiwork until Mr. Beaver's belly began to grumble. That sound means it's time for me to go get dinner. Thank you very much for your help, said Roz. We could not have done this without you. You're quite welcome, said Mr. Beaver, smiling. For your garden, you'll want to speak with Tawny, the doe who lives over the, over the hill. She'll know just what to do. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'll have, I have to hurry home before Paddler eats all the best leaves. Enjoy your first night in the nest. Chapter 31, The First Night. The stars were out. A fire was crackling in the fire pit. Roz and Bright Bill were settling into their first night in their new home. This lodge is where we will live from now on. The robot plucked her son from his little woven nest and placed him on the floor. I hope you like it. The gosling did like it. He liked that it was big and warm and peaceful, and he liked knowing that the forest and the pond were just outside. He waddled around, peeping to himself, and exploring every little corner of the lodge until it was time for bed. His mother carefully laid him on a soft cushion of moss, but he didn't want to sleep there, so she put him back in his little nest, but he didn't want to sleep there either. Bright Bill looked up and said, Mama, sit. Roz sat down. Then he said, Mama, hold. Roz held him. The robot's body may have been hard and mechanical, but it was also strong and safe. The gosling felt loved. His eyes slowly winked closed, and he spent the whole night quietly sleeping in his mother's arms. End chapter. All right, boys and girls, that's all for today. I will talk to you guys later. Hope you're enjoying it.